My name is Brad Griesiak, and uh, that is how you pronounce it. Or if you're in Poland, it's Grzeszek or just Gur, right? Um, I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of BendyWorks. Um, you can find me on tw Twitter as Listrophy. Um, I do have one payload that I worked on that's currently in space. It's growing food uh, that astronauts can eat. So basically, the, the next step towards generation ships, which is pretty cool. Um, but I'm here today to talk about video games in outer space. Um, specifically uh, Kerbal Space Program. So I'm good friends with a woman named Ash Dryden. Uh, give it up for Ash. So this is actually a quote from her. Like I asked her for this quote and she gave it to me. Whenever Brad is drinking, you want to make sure you're sitting next to him because instead of being obnoxious, he teaches you orbital mechanics. This is true. You also don't need to say the first part. Um, you just you can sit next to me, and I'll teach you orbital science uh, mechanics, whether I've had alcohol or not. Um, I love teaching people about this kind of stuff. Also related to Ash, uh, get your Alter Conf tickets. There's only two left. One of them is in Portland in like a week, and then uh, San Francisco after that. It's a really cool thing. All right. So uh, prerequisites for putting on a talk like this. Um, First of all, you have to buy uh, Kerbal Space Program. It's, it runs for about 40 bucks on Steam. But as of today, thanks, <laughs> thanks to Ben for informing me of this, it's actually on sale uh, through November 1st. So 24 bucks gets you Kerbal Space Program. Uh, you need to install CCAN, uh, which is basically CCAN, but for Kerbal, the Comprehensive Kerbal Archive Network. Um, using CCAN, you can install a thing called KRPC. You might also want to learn a few things about astrodynamics. So I would advise if you want to go to UW-Madison, you would take EMA, that's Engineering Mechanics and Astronautics, 550, which is astrodynamics. And then also you might want to take the Mechanical Engineering 446, Automatic Controls. This was uh, the second lowest achieving uh, class that I took in college, um, mostly because it was an online class. Uh, apparently, that doesn't work so well for me. Um, install Ruby correctly, which is probably the hardest thing to do on this slide. <laughs> uh, and then you want to gem install KRPC. So um, the KRPC in the third bullet point is like this generic add-on mod for Kerbal Space Program. And there's a bunch of libraries that, uh, that you can then use to connect to Kerbal. Um, and this is just the, the Ruby version of that. You have to write some Ruby, and, and you're good to go. So I'd uh, like uh, all of you who would like to um, get on the uh, local network for, uh, what is it, um, Alamo Wi-Fi and go to this URL. I couldn't be bothered to port forward uh, 80 to 3,000. Um, also, this server is running in development mode. So let's hope that it continues to work. Um, but that should take you to this computer right here um, that's running a, a rail server. Um, so. First project that we're going to do today, uh, we'll call it Project Mercury, and we're going to hover a spacecraft. Uh, not quite get it to outer space yet, just, just kind of hover. All right, so that's our product, pro, uh, problem statement. Take a rocket, hover. Well, what does that mean? What are, what are some of the key words in here? Well, the first is hover, and what we mean by that is we want to make altitude constant and sufficiently above zero so that we're not just standing there. We're actually above the ground. And the other key word here is rocket. So in our situation, we're going to have exactly one input, which is the throttle. Um, and it's also going to have a variable mass, which is uh, kind of tricky to deal with. Because as the, the throttle goes above zero, you are shooting some of your mass out the business end of the rocket. And so you, the whole thing is going to get lighter as time progresses forward. Um, so taking all that into account, you get some math. All right, let's do some statics here, right? No. Uh, so we have this, the, the force equals ma, and you get all this stuff, and you end up with this last part, which is actually a nonlinear second order differential equation, which is frowny face. Uh, like, you do not want to deal with this. This is terrible. You do not want to, this. Um, so what are, what are we going to do about this? this? This is a hard thing to do. And also, it, it, uh, it only takes into account the, the two forces that we know of which is gravity and thrust. What about any sort of perturbations? Or what if we don't know the perfect amount of thrust that we're sending out the, the business end of this rocket? Like, you don't know. Like, is it 3,000 uh, kilonewtons, or is it 3,001 kilonewtons? Like, you don't know. Um, so it's really hard to be able to accomplish anything by going with this 
correct mathematical approach. So what are we going to do instead? We're going to use what's called PID controller. PID stands for Proportional Integral Derivative Controller, which again seems very mathy, very unattractive. Like I don't want to touch that. That looks gross. Um, in calculus, calculus. Sometimes I just don't want to do integrals. Uh, the the great thing about a uh, PID controller is that you're not actually going to be doing any integration or derivatives. Like that's the that's the really really good news. The hardest mathematical operation you're going to use in a PID controller is division. It's pretty reasonable. So this is uh, kind of the feedback diagram of how this is going to work. We're going to set a throttle, and that throttle goes to a rocket which turns the throttle amount into an actual altitude. That actual altitude is going to change over time. And we're going to, sh uh, we're going to have a sensor that, that detects how high we are, what our actual altitude, shunt that into our PID controller, and we're also going to tell it what our desired altitude is. And it's going to do, again, some simple mathematics, only up to division, and then it's going to come up with a new throttle that we want to use to um, send back into the rocket. So it's going to automatically change the throttle based on the inputs of the actual altitude, uh, the desired altitude, and any sort of state that it has inside of it. So this is called a, a negative feedback controller. Um, we, we like to talk about in, in programming, or, or like in the management of people, we want to have positive feedback systems. Um, and that's, I, I usually say like that's, that's not actually what you want. You, you generally want a negative feedback system. But, uh, when you're talking about a positive feedback system, what you end up with is uh, a diverging situation, right? which is actually what you would want in a uh, people management of assuming that you're diverging in the positive. You want people to get better and better and better over time. In our situation, however, we don't want to di diverge. We want to converge. And so we want a negative feedback system to, to dial into the actual desired altitude that we want. So this is our PID controller in Ruby. That's it. We do some setup, we, we check the current time, uh, we do a loop, we sleep like a little bit of amount of time, um, and then we calculate three things. We calculate the error, which is just the difference between where we are now and where we want to be. We uh, keep track of an accumulated error, um, and so uh, we take that, where we are, that error that we're at right now and multiply that by the, the, the difference in time that we slept. And then we take a derivative, which is basically, again, this is where the, the division comes in. Hang with me. Um, and we come up with another number. And then you can see we have the PID. And those are just constants that, uh, we, can, that we can come up with uh, via trial by error. Or you can actually do some really interesting math using Laplacian transforms and spend hours and hours to figure out what you could figure out in, in like a few minutes of trial and error. So that's uh, super exciting. But then you just set the throttle, and, and that's it. And, and you, you save some state for later. And with that, you can actually get a, a rocket to hover, basically, assuming you, you have some sort of control to make sure that it doesn't tip over, of course. But we're not going to deal with that. So would you like to see what that looks like? <laughs> All right. Uh, exit. So this is Kerbal Space Program. I'm going to start a game. We're going to resume. KRPC. <clears throat> um, over here, you can see the KRPC server. This is uh, part of the, the add-on that I have installed. I'm just going to start that server. Uh, we're going to go to the uh, vehicle assembly building. And we're going to load um, a rocket that I've already uh, created called the small AA1 small hoverer. We've got to have a, a call sign for that, which makes it easy to find. And it's this little guy. It's, isn't that cute? So we're going to launch it um, with, uh, with one poor soul inside of it. Um, and his, her name is uh, Valentina Kerman. Um, so we're at 78 uh, meters because we're, we're above sea level um, at this point. So I'm going to pull this over to the side and bring up. This is uh, the local host version of Space Avail. It is the same server, but because browsers don't like when 127.0.0.1, and I don't know. Um, that's not my area of expertise, but it works for me, and you should all be on space.fail uh, colon 3000. 
Um, and it just says not active because we're not actually doing any, anything yet. So let's go to the, the terminal. Um, we have uh, one file in this particular folder, uh, appropriately named go. Um, I guess it is the opposite of no go, so uh, we're going to just go ahead and run that. Um, and that's gonna do like a countdown three, two, one, give me enough time to, to um, show the, the appropriate windows. And then here we go, so, all right. Three, two, one. There we go, let's take it off. Um, this probably should have been refreshed. <laughs> Live demos, everyone. Well, if you have it in front of you, you should be seeing um, uh, some, some graphs. Um, yeah, great. Yeah, so again, this is running in development uh, mode, so maybe the, the whole asynchronous aspect isn't quite working. But uh, if you look at the graphs, you'll see one which is the altitude, and it's very pretty, and it kind of goes like this. Um, and then the other graph is the, the PID uh, variables that change over time, and then you can see the throttle as well and the, and the fuel. And so what we see here is that um, right here, we have uh, the throttle, and, um, and up here we have the, the height. So I had set the, the desired uh, altitude to 250 meters, and so uh, it basically feathered, oh, there we go. Well, now that all the data is gone, it's kind of boring to watch, but, uh, but that's what it looks like. And um, as it's going, um, you can actually see the, the throttle down here is going down because uh, the, the craft is getting lighter. And like, I didn't program this, like, all I wrote was basically those, those couple of lines of determining the error, the accumulated error, and the derivative. Um, and it's just doing it for me. So this is an example of uh, you know, stepping back from what seems like a really, really hard uh, mathematical problem and seeing, oh, someone else has solved this in a much, much uh, easier kind of way. Um, one, fun, uh, one, one way to, uh, to see how this, this works with the de decreasing mass is if we cancel this, um, the rocket will eventually start moving up. So up here we can see 253, 254. It's going up because it's stuck at the same throttle, but it's getting lighter, so it's just kind of going up uh, until it runs out of fuel. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Uh, so that's hovering. Cool. Next up, Orbit, uh, Project Gemini. We have a new problem statement. We're going to make a or, uh, rocket orbit. We already know what a rocket is, uh, but what does orbit mean? What, what should we define that as? Um, well, it's basically go really high, and then on the way back down, just miss. <laughs> Thanks to Douglas Adams for the inspiration there. Um, that's basically what's happening. Like, you just go really high, and like, you make sure that you're going fast enough that way so that you just kind of miss the Earth as you, as you come back down. So let's get a better visualization of what that actually means. Uh, well, we have our rocket, first of all. It's going to be a multi-stage rocket. Uh, we have our first stage, which is these two little boosters here. Um, second stage is the, the bottom half here. And then we have a, a third stage. And the reason you have these different stages is because um, if you just have one big rocket with one stage, um, all the extra weight of the empty portion of the fuel tank um, just bogs you down quite a bit. And so you want to release mass so that your rocket gets lighter and so you can get more, you know, the force kind of uh, results in, in more acceleration. So that's our rocket. And uh, let's talk about what orbit actually means here. So here we have a space station. Um, and let's draw a, line, a straight line. We're not going to follow the, the curvature of the Earth, which is hard to visualize because the Earth is so big. Um, but let's just draw a horizontal line here, and you know, it just goes off into space. All right? Now, Let's, um, let's pretend that this spaceship is going to zoom really fast in that direction. And then, um, you know, at the same time, gravity is acting on it. And gravity is pulling it towards the center of the Earth. Um, so it follows it, uh, it, it pulls down in, in kind of a slightly uh, slanted direction, right? So it falls towards the Earth. So uh, you can imagine that even though we showed actual curvature here, these two things are actually happening at the same time. So what does, this, what does this mean? And you end up in this, this curve, right? Because they are happening at the same time. You don't get some weird jagged effect of going around the, the Earth. So in relative terms that, that we can understand here, um, let's pretend that that's one foot above the ground 
and we're going from Austin to Houston. Um, do you like my drawing of Minute Maid Park? Uh, so the, 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 uh, the, the curved distance um, from Austin to Houston as the, as the bird flies is 237 kilometers. Okay, so if you go in this uh, yellow straight line, 237 kilometers, uh, starting at one, feet, one foot above Austin, you end up 4.41 kilometers above Houston. Okay, so that's the difference in curvature of the Earth between a, like a, a perfectly flat line at Austin down to Houston. All right, so I guess that means in, uh, uh, that you, like, how, how long does it take for something to drop? 4.41 kilometers, and then the, the answer is about 30 seconds. Um, so now you think, okay, well that means I guess we have to go from Austin to Houston in 30 seconds. How, how fast is that? That's, that's 7.9 kilometers per second. That's really, really fast, and that is actually what you need to do in order to achieve orbit, um, basically at one foot. At 200 kilometers high, it's, uh, it's a measly 7.8 kilometers per second. Um, but the further away you get from the surface of the Earth, or really the core of the Earth, uh, the slower you have to go to be in orbit. Um, but yeah, so if, if I were to run straight at, at Houston, um, I'd have to be going 7.9 kilometers per second, uh, such that... The, the gravity pulling me down on each step is about as fast as the Earth is falling away from me. Like that's how fast you have to go. So that's, that's pretty fast. What are the energies required to do something like that? Uh, well, to get up into space, say uh, 200 kilometers, um, you do some you know, potential energy calculations, and you end up, for every kilogram, uh, it costs about two megajoules to get it up 200 kilometers. Uh, but to get it going sideways fast enough, it takes 30 me megajoules per kilogram to get it going uh, that fast to be in orbit. So we think of like how much energy it takes just to get into space, and that's, that's peanuts compared to how fast you actually have to get in order to achieve orbit. It's a difference of 15 times. All right, so how, how are we going to actually achieve that? Uh, well, we're going to have a checklist, just like NASA does. Uh, we're going to have two uh, state machines. One of them controls the different stages, so we're going to be dropping off engines, and they might explode because they hit each other on the way down, and that's going to be really cool. Um, uh, and then we're going to have a second state machine, which is the control aspect, the steering and the throttle aspect. Um, and then on each tick of like the 0.1 or 0.2 seconds, uh, we're going to evaluate what we're going to do um, based on the, the two different states, and we're just going to have a case statement that determines uh, what to actually do. And then on each state transition, we're going to determine what to do. So for example, when we say we want to transition from stage one to stage two, um, we're going to tell Kerbal Space Program to activate the next stage, which drops off the, the engines. Um, so you have two instances of, of things going on. You have like uh, like an instance of doing one thing, and then you have the instance of doing it every single tick. Um, and relying on state machines in this situation is absolutely crucial. The fewer if statements to determine like what's the what's inside of my state, uh, the fewer of those, the better, because you want to re like rely really heavily on your state machines. And what we want to do is basically just pitch over um, so that we're going sideways by the time we get up into space um, while we're managing the staging of the, the thing. So, Let's see how to do that. Exit here. All right, we are going to uh, revert to vehicle assembly. We're going to load this. This rocket, as you might imagine, is not going to cut it to get into space. So we're going to use the AA2 Kerbal 1 launchable, which looks a little bit more like that. And you saw that already in the slides. So. KRPC going. Valentina's back in there. Great. All right, so we're going to go up to uh, orbit. And here you can see we've got a, a couple of different Ruby files. We've got a checklist file, a mission control, and then a state factory that just gets all the, the data out of uh, Kerbal Space Program. So again, we're just going to run go. And uh, this time, instead of doing a countdown, um, uh, one of the cool things with uh, this mod is that you can um, play with the UI in Kerbal. So we'll do that. And um, 
well. <laughs> There's supposed to be uh, a button that shows up, which is not showing up. So we may have to skip this demo. Do you need to restart the server? Uh, do I need to restart the server in Kerbal? Well, um, probably yeah. not, but we can certainly try restarting that. So that start it up. Um, I doubt this is going to make a difference. You're probably going to have to re reload your browsers here. Um, and uh, it's not doing it. No, that it needs to happen here. So. Let me uh, quit out of here and, and come back in. In all the uh, <laughs> all the times that I've tested this out, this situation has never actually happened. So that's exciting. No. Nope. Um, again, it's probably one of these like uh, hitting the wrong. Uh, 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 IP addresses. Let's see here. Probably be in. St um. No, that should work. All right. Well, I guess we're going to have to skip that demo. Um, that's a bummer. Sorry, everyone. It works. I promise. <laughs> Live demos, the worst. Um, so, uh, I encourage you to, to get the game because it is like really, uh, amazing the first time you get into space. You can look from the cockpit and like, oh, I'm in space. All right, uh, let's go to the moon. And yes, it's spelled that way in the game. Um, so Project Apollo, uh, we're going to land a rocket on the moon. Um, as programmers, we might uh, take um, this problem statement and uh, make a few uh, interpretations or implications out of this. So for example, the landing speed is not specified in this <laughs> problem statement. <laughs> so we're just going to kind of go with it and see what the, uh, the, what the stakeholder says. <laughs> so uh, orbital transfers. Uh, so what I'm going to teach to you is called the, the Hohmann transfer orbit. And so we have this spaceship that's in a circular orbit above a, a body, um, going around in a circle. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, fire. Um, and then what that's going to do is it's going to lengthen the orbit on the other side. And so it's going to go into that larger orbit. OK? And now we're in this elliptical orbit. And we don't want to be in an elliptical orbit, perhaps. Perhaps we want to be in a circular orbit. So what we do, uh, uh, again, is fire the rockets. And that pushes the, the other side, the original side, into a larger orbit. And so that's how we get into a larger orbit, uh, at least with regular chemical rockets. If we're talking about ion drives, it's a completely different thing. If you've seen The Martian, um, what they show in the movie is not correct. They do not need a supercomputer to figure this out. However, in the book, they do it properly. Um, they say that it's an ion engine. so. Uh, just goes to show that literature is better than movies um, sometimes. The book was better, like, honestly. <laughs> All right, so how, how are we going to do this with uh, getting to the moon? Um, well, we're going to you know, have the moon set up, uh, and we want to not just get to that same circle um, uh, of, of a larger orbit, but we also want to um, get to that circle at the same time that the moon is there. So we're going to go there, we're going to fire an engine, go into a larger... Uh, orbit and then meet the moon <laughs> at an unspecified speed. <laughs> so uh, these are all the different states that we have to do in in this uh, setup to make it happen. Uh, we've got to you know determine how big the burn has to be. So that's determining the insertion burn delta v. A lot of jargon here. Sorry. Uh, and then we need to determine the location of where we're going to have that burn happen. Because uh, if we get to the, the lunar or sorry the lunar orbit um, and the moon isn't there, that's a problem. So we want to determine when we want to fire the insertion burn. 
Uh, then we're going to wait for the point at which we're, uh, we're ready to burn. We're going to, uh, we have a far near mid here because we're going to use a warp factor in the game so we don't have to sit here and uh, wait until like basically the end of the conference. Um, we're going to actually do the burn, uh, which basically means instead of doing 100% a, a throttle, we're going to bring it down to like 10% throttle just so that we can get a more precise finish to that. Uh, we're going to go into our transmunar orbit. We're going to do outer moon orbit, mid, and final approach. Um, and final approach is the last state for obvious reasons. All right, so let's hope this works. <laughs> Um, we're going to load a save to the moon. We're actually going to start off in, uh, in orbit, uh, just to avoid the having to get into orbit and everything. So um, here we are. We're in orbit. There's our, this is like the last stage of a multi-stage rocket. Um, I'll kind of zoom out here. And oh, there's, a, there's the Kerbin, not Earth, Kerbin. Um, and so we're, we're around that. So this is kind of the, the overview, uh, uh, like, orbital thing here. So this kind of looks familiar from the last couple of slides, right? We are in this tiny orbit, and we want to get to this big orbit where the moon is. See? The moon. <laughs> All right. So um, I really hope this works this time. Um, and um, this, uh, if I haven't made the implication already, the uh, directory of where this uh, should probably kind of give it away. Um, <laughs> All right. So this is, uh, again, just going to uh, start immediately. And um, all right, so you can see, so what we're doing is we, we're adding a planning node um, that's just creeping its way out by, we're going to tell it, like, uh, add a little bit of extra oomph to it. Is that, is that far enough? No. Okay, keep going. And now we're at that, the right uh, distance. But if we, had done, if we had just stopped there, we would have ended up where the moon is now, but not where it's going to be, you know, hockey and all that. Skate to where the, the moon is going to be. Um, so now we're determining, oh, now we're going to get into the, the sphere of influence of the moon, and there's a, oh, and now we're, we've established an orbit uh, that will figure out, um, that will get us there. I'll probably refresh this. And we have a, kind of a dashboard. Hopefully some of you are seeing that. Again, you had to uh, restart that. Because action cable, woo! <laughs> oh. Um, <laughs> So uh, we're about to do our insertion burn, and um, we're lined up, and oh, there it goes. You can see the throttle uh, jump up. It was uh, down here, and it went up to here. And so you can see the blue line is uh, slowly growing to where we need it to go. Um, and this dashboard code is all written in Elm, too. So if you want to talk about that um, afterwards, I love to spread the word of Elm. Um, it's using the action cable uh, Elm package that yours truly wrote. So here we go. We're, we're doing this insertion burn. This is how much uh, delta V that we have left to do in the insertion burn. As we get around like uh, 30 or 20, it's going to go into that finalizing in insertion burn. I'm going to jump that throttle way down. Get to about zero. Close enough. All right. Cool. So we're going to time warp because, again, this would take forever. Um, and uh, so the problem with this game is that, uh, well, there are, there are many problems with the game. But one of the ma major problems with the game is that it, it doesn't do multi-body physics. It only does like two-body physics. And so in the game, um, let's, let's zoom in here. Let's see, uh, there's the sun. Oh, there's the moon. Um, so you can't do a three-body problem uh, situation, which means you can't do uh, Lagrange points, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, but it would just make the game a lot harder to program for the folks. So it's, we're coming in real fast, but we're, we're warping, right? So, OK, we're back to like normal speed here. Um, and here we go. We want like a, a profile version of this. Coming down, coming down. There's three of them on this one. Jebediah, Bill, and Bob. Hope you enjoy the landing. <laughs> and boom. <laughs> and that's it. Uh, thank you. Uh, Turbonauts for that. And appropriately, my Ruby program crashes once there's no vessel to talk to. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's it. Thank you very much. Um, if you would like to see a demo of the middle uh, project, 
um, in person. I'm, I'd be more than happy to show it to you, not up on stage. Um, but thanks again, and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.